Part the Second, The Papyrus, Section Two, of Thais by Anatole France. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part the Second, Section Two. After Thais had several years enjoyed the admiration and affection of the Antiochians, she was taken with a desire to revisit Alexandria, and show her glory in that city in which, as a child, she had wandered in want and shame, hungry and lean as a grasshopper in the middle of a dusty road. The Golden City joyfully welcomed her, and loaded her with fresh riches, when she appeared in the games, it was a triumph. Countless admirers and lovers came to her. She received them with indifference, for she at last despaired of meeting another Lolius. Among many others, she met the philosopher Nicias, who desired to possess her, although he professed to have no desires. In spite of his riches, he was intelligent and modest but his delicate wit and beautiful sentiments failed to charm her. She did not love him, and sometimes his refined irony even irritated her. His perpetual doubts hurt her, for he believed in nothing, and she believed in everything. She believed in divine providence, in the omnipotence of evil spirits, in spells, exorcisms and eternal justice she believed in jesus christ and in the goddess of good of the syrians she believed also that the bitches barked when the black hecate passed through the streets and that a woman could inspire love by pouring a filter into a cup wrapped in the bleeding skin of a sheep she thirsted for the unknown she called on nameless gods and lived in perpetual expectation the future frightened her, and yet she wished to know it. She surrounded herself with priests of Isis, Chaldean Magi, pharmacopolists, and professors of the black arts, who invariably deceived her, though she never tired of being deceived. She feared death, and she saw it everywhere. When she yielded to pleasure, it seemed to her that an icy finger would suddenly touch her on the bare shoulder, and she turned pale and cried with terror in the arms which embraced her. Nicias said to her, What does it matter, O oh my Thais, whether we descend to eternal night with white locks and hollow cheeks, or whether this very day, now laughing, to the vast sky shall be our last? Let us enjoy life. We shall have greatly lived if we have greatly loved. There is no knowledge except that of the senses. To love is to understand. That which we do not know does not exist. What good is it to worry ourselves about nothing? She replied angrily, I despise men like you who hope for nothing and fear nothing. I wish to know. I wish to know. In order to understand the secret of life, she set to work to read the books of the philosophers. But she did not understand them. The further the years of her childhood receded from her, the more anxious she was to recall them. She loved to traverse at night in disguise the alleys, squares, and places where she had grown up so miserably. She was sorry she had lost her parents, and especially that she had not been able to love them. When she met any Christian priest, she thought of her baptism, and felt troubled. One night, when enveloped in a long cloak, and her fair hair hidden under her black hood, she was wandering, according to her custom, about the suburbs of the city. She found herself, without knowing how she came there, before the poor little church of St. John the Baptist. They were singing inside the church, and a bright light glimmered through the chinks of the door. There was nothing strange in that, as for the past twenty years the Christians, protected by the conqueror of Maxentius, had publicly solemnized their festivals. But these hymns seemed more like an ardent appeal to the soul, 
as if she had been invited to the mysteries, she pushed the door open with her arm and entered the building. She found a numerous assembly of women, children, and old men on their knees before a tomb which stood against the wall. The tomb was nothing but a stone coffer, roughly sculpted with vine tendrils and bunches of grapes, yet it had received great honors, and was covered with green palms and wreaths of red roses. All around innumerable lights gleamed out of heavy shadow, in which the smoke of Arabian gums seemed like the folds of angels' robes, and the paintings on the walls visions of paradise. Priests, clad in white, were prostrate at the foot of the sarcophagus. The hymns they sang with the people expressed the delight of suffering, and mingled in a triumphal morning so much joy with so much grief that Thais, in listening to them, felt the pleasures of life and the terrors of death flowing at the same time through her reawakened senses. When they had finished singing, the believers rose and walked in single file to the tomb, the side of which they kissed. They were common men, accustomed to work with their hands. They advanced with a heavy step, the eyes fixed with the jaw dropped. But they had an air of sincerity. They knelt down, each in turn before the sarcophagus, and put their lips to it. The women lifted their little children in their arms and gently placed their cheek to the stone. Thais, surprised and troubled, asked the deacon why they did so. Do you not know, woman, replied the deacon, that we celebrate today the blessed memory of St. Theodore the Nubian, who suffered for the faith in the days of the emperor Diocletian? He lived virtuously and died a martyr, and that is why, robed in white, we bear red roses to his glorious tomb. On hearing these words, Thais fell on her knees and burst into tears. Half-forgotten recollection of alms returned to her mind on the memory of this obscure, gentle, and unfortunate man, the blaze of candles, the perfume of roses, the clouds of incense, the music of hymns, the piety of souls, through all the charms of glory. Thais thought in the dazzling glare, He was good, and now he has become great and glorious. Why is it that he is elevated above other men? What is this unknown thing which is more than riches or pleasure? She rose slowly and turned towards the tomb of the saint who had loved her. Those violet eyes, now filled with tears which glittered in the candlelight, then, with bowed head, humble, slow, and the last, with those lips on which so many desires hung, she kissed the stone of the slave's tomb. When she returned to her house, she found Nicias, who, with his hair perfumed and his tunic thrown open, was reading a treatise on morals, whilst waiting for her. He advanced with open arms. Naughty Thais, he said, in a laughing voice, whilst I was waiting for you to come, do you know what I saw in this manuscript, written by the gravest of Stoics? precepts of virtue and noble maxims? No. On the staid papyrus I saw dance thousands and thousands of little Thaises. Each was no bigger than my finger, and yet their grace was infinite, and all were the only Thais. There were some who flaunted in mantles of purple and gold, others like a white cloud floated in the air in transparent drapery, others again motionless and divinely nude, the better to inspire pleasure, expressed no thought. Lastly, there were two, hand in hand, two so alike that it was impossible to distinguish one from the other. Both smiled. The first said, I am love. The other, I am death. 
Thus speaking, he pressed Thais in his arms, and not noticing the sullen look in her downcast eyes, he went on adding thought to thought, heedless of the fact that they were all lost upon her. Yes, when I had before my eyes the line in which it was written, nothing should deter you from improving your mind, I read, the kisses of Thais are warmer than fire, sweeter than honey. That is how a philosopher reads the books of other philosophers, and that is your fault, you naughty child. It is true that, as long as we are what we are, we shall never find anything but our own thoughts in the thoughts of others, and that all of us are somewhat inclined to read books as I have read this one. She did not hear him. Her soul was still before the Nubian's tomb. As he heard her sigh, he kissed her on the neck and said, Do not be sad, my child. We are never happy in this world, except when we forget this world. Come, let us cheat life. It is sure to take its revenge. Come, let us love. But she pushed him away. We love? She cried bitterly. You never loved anyone, and I do not love you. No, I do not love you. I hate you. Go, I hate you. I curse and despise all who are happy and all who are rich. Go, go. Goodness is only found amongst the unfortunate. When I was a child, I knew a black slave who died on the cross. He was good. He was filled with love, and he knew the secret of life. You are not worthy to wash his feet. Go, I never wish to see you again. She threw herself on her face on the carpet and passed the night sobbing and weeping and forming resolutions to live in future like St. Theodore in poverty and humbleness. The next day she devoted herself again to those pleasures to which she was addicted as she knew that her beauty, though still intact, would not last very long, she hastened to derive all the enjoyment and all the fame she could from it. At the theater where she acted and studied more than ever, she gave life to the imagination of sculptors, painters, and poets. Recognizing that there was in the attitudes, movements, and walk of the actress an idea of the divine harmony which rules the spheres, Wise men and philosophers considered that such perfect grace was a virtue in itself, and said, Thais is also a geometrician. The ignorant, the poor, the humble, and the timid, before whom she consented to appear, regarded her as a blessing from heaven. Yet she was sad amidst all the praise she received, and dreaded death more than ever. Nothing was able to set her mind at rest, not even her house and gardens, which were celebrated in a proverb throughout the city. The gardens were planted with trees, brought at great expense from India and Persia. They were watered by a running brook, and colonnades and ruins and imitation rocks arranged by a skillful artist were reflected in a lake, which also mirrored the statues that stood around it. In the middle of the garden was the Grotto of Nymphs, which owed its name to three life-size figures of women which stood on the threshold. They were represented as divesting themselves of their garments and about to bathe. They anxiously turned their heads, fearing to be seen, and looked as though they were alive. The only light which entered the building came tempered and iridescent through thin sheets of water. All the walls were hung, as in the sacred grottoes, with wreaths, garlands, and votive pictures, in which the beauty of Thais was celebrated. There were also tragic and comic masks, bright with colors and paintings representing theatrical scenes or grotesque figures, or fabulous animals. On a stele, in the center stood a little ivory eros of wonderful antique workmanship. It was a gift from Nicias. In one of the bays was a figure of a goat 
in black marble with shining agate eyes. Six alabaster kids crowded around its teats, but, raising its cloven hoofs and its ugly head, it seemed impatient to climb the rocks. The floor was covered with Byzantine carpets, pillows embroidered by the yellow men of Cathay, and the skins of Libyan lions. Perfume smoke rose from golden censers. Flowering plants grew in large onyx vases, and at the far end, in the purple shadow, gleamed the gold nails on the shell of a huge Indian tortoise turned upside down, which served as the bed of the actress. It was here that every day, to the murmur of the water and amid perfumes and flowers, Thais reclined softly and conversed with her friends while waiting the hour of supper, or meditated in solitude on theatrical art, or on the flight of years. On the afternoon of the games, Thais was reposing in the Grotto of Nymphs. She had noticed in her mirror the first signs of decay of her beauty, and she was frightened to think that white hair and wrinkles would at last come. She vainly tried to comfort herself with the assurance that she could recover her fresh complexion by burning certain herbs and pronouncing a few magic words. A pitiless voice cried, You will grow old, Thais. You will grow old. And a cold sweat of terror bedewed her forehead. Then, on looking at herself again in the mirror with infinite tenderness, she found that she was still beautiful and worthy to be loved. She smiled to herself and murmured, There is not a woman in Alexandria who can rival me in suppleness or grace or movement or in splendor of arms, and the arms, my mirror, are the real chains of love. While she was thus thinking, she saw an unknown man, thin, with burning eyes and unkempt beard, and clad in a richly embroidered robe, standing before her. She let fall her mirror, and uttered a cry of fright. Paphnutius stood motionless, and seeing how beautiful she was, he murmured this prayer from the bottom of his heart. Grant, my God, that the face of this woman may not be a temptation, but may prove salutary to thy servant. Then, forcing himself to speak, he said, Thais, I live in a far country, and the fame of thy beauty has led me to thee. It is said that thou art the most clever of actresses, and the most irresistible of women. That which was related of thy riches and thy love affairs seems fabulous, and calls to mind the old story of Rodeau, whose marvelous history is known by heart to all the boatmen on the Nile. Therefore I was seized with a desire to know thee, and I see that the truth surpasses the rumor. Thou art a thousand times more clever and more beautiful than is reported." And now that I see thee, I say to myself, it is impossible to approach her without staggering like a drunken man. The words were feigned, but the monk, animated by pious zeal, uttered them with real warmth. Thais gazed without displeasure at this strange being who had frightened her. The rough, wild aspect and the fiery glances of his eyes astonished her. She was curious to learn the state of life of a man so different from all others she had met. She replied, with gentle raillery, You seem prompt to admire, stranger. Beware that my looks do not consume you to the bones. Beware of loving me. He said, I love thee, O Thais, I love thee more than life, and more than myself, for thee I have quitted the desert. For thee my lips, vowed to silence, have pronounced profane words. For thee 
I have seen what I ought not to have seen, and heard what is forbidden for me to hear. For thee my soul is troubled, my heart is open, and the thoughts gush out like the running springs at which the pigeons drink. For thee I have walked day and night across sandy deserts teeming with reptiles and vampires. For thee I have placed my bare foot on vipers and scorpions. Yes, I love thee. I love thee, but not like those men who, burning with the lust of the flesh, come to thee like devouring wolves or furious bulls. Thou art dear to them, as is the gazelle to the lion. Their ravening lust will consume thee to the soul. O oh, woman, I love thee in spirit and in truth. I love thee in God, and for ever and ever that which is in my breast is named true zeal and divine charity. I promise thee better things than drunkenness crowned with flowers or the dreams of a brief night. I promise thee holy feasts and celestial suppers. The happiness that I bring thee will never end. It is unheard of, it is ineffable, and such that if the happy of this world could only see the shadow of it, they would die of wonder. Thais laughed mischievously. Friend, she said, show me this wonderful love. Make haste. A long speeches would be an insult to my beauty. Let us not lose a moment. I am impatient to taste the felicity you announce. But, to say the truth, I fear that I shall always remain ignorant of it, and that all you have promised me will vanish in words. It is easier to promise a great happiness than to give it. Everyone has a talent of some sort. I fancy that yours is to make long speeches. You speak of an unknown love. It is so long since kisses were first exchanged that it would be very extraordinary if there still remain secrets in love. On this subject, lovers know more than philosophers. Do not jest, Thais. I bring thee the unknown love. Friend, you come too late. I know every kind of love. The love that I bring thee abounds with glory, whilst the loves that thou knowest breed only shame. Thais looked at him with an angry eye and a frown gathered on her beautiful face. You are very bold, stranger, to offend your hostess. Look at me, and say if I resemble a creature crushed down with shame. No, I am not ashamed, and all others who live like me are not ashamed either, although they are not so beautiful or so rich as I am. I have sown pleasure in my footsteps, and I am celebrated for that all over the world. I am more powerful than the masters of the world. I have seen them at my feet. Look at me. Look at these little feet. Thousands of men would pay with their blood for the happiness of kissing them. I am not very big, and I do not occupy much space on this earth. To those who look at me from the top of the Serapium, when I pass in the street, I look like a grain of rice. But that grain of rice has caused among men Griefs, despairs, hates, and crimes enough to have filled Tartarus. Are you not mad to talk to me of shame when all around proclaims my glory? That which is glory in the eyes of men is infamy before God. O oh, woman, we have been nourished in countries so different that it is not surprising we have neither the same language nor the same thoughts. Yet heaven is my witness that I wish to agree with thee, and that it is my intention not to leave thee until we share the same sentiments. Who will inspire me with burning words that will melt thee like wax in my breath, O oh, woman, that the fingers of my desires may mold thee as they wish? What virtue will deliver thee to me O oh, dearest of souls, 
that the spirit which animates me, creating thee a second time, may imprint on thee a fresh beauty, and that thou mayest cry, weeping for joy, it is only now that I am born? Who will cause to gush in my heart a fount of Siloam, in which thou mayest bathe and recover thy first purity? Who will change me into a Jordan, the waves of which sprinkled on thee, will give thee life eternal. Thais was no longer angry. This man, she thought, talks of life eternal, and all that he says seems written on a talisman. No doubt he is a mage, and knows the secret charms against old age and death and she resolved to offer herself to him. Therefore, pretending to be afraid of him, she retired a few steps to the end of the grotto, and sitting down on the edge of the bed, artfully pulled her tunic across her breast. Then motionless and mute, and her eyes cast down, she waited. Her long eyelashes made a soft shadow on her cheeks. Her entire attitude expressed modesty. Her naked feet swung gently, and she looked like a child sitting, thinking on the bank of a brook. But Paphnutius looked at her and did not move. His trembling knees hardly supported him. His tongue dried in his mouth. A terrible buzzing rang in his ears. But all at once his sight failed and he could see nothing before him but a thick cloud. He thought that the hand of Jesus had been laid on his eyes to hide this woman from them. Reassured by such succor, strengthened and fortified, he said with a gravity worthy of an old hermit of the desert, If thou givest thyself to me, thinkest thou it is hidden from God? She shook her head. God, who forces him to keep his eye always upon the grotto of the nymphs? Let him go away if we offend him. But why should we offend him? Since he has created us, he can be neither angry nor surprised to see us as he made us, and acting according to the nature he has given us. A good deal too much is said on his behalf, and he is often credited with ideas he never had. You yourself, stranger, do you know his true character? Who are you, that you should speak to me in his name? At this question, the monk, opening his borrowed robe, showed the cassock, and said, I am Paphnutius, abbot of Antinoe, and I come from the holy desert. The hand that drew Abraham from Chaldea and Lot from Sodom has separated me from the present age. I no longer existed for the men of this century. But thy image appeared to me in my sandy Jerusalem, and I knew that thou wert full of corruption, and death was in thee. And now I am before thee, woman, as before a grave, and I cry unto thee, Thais, Arise! At the words, Paphnutius, the monk, the abbot, she had turned pale with fright. And now, with disheveled hair and joined hands, weeping and groaning, she dragged herself to the feet of the saint. Do not hurt me. Why have you come? What do you want of me? Do not hurt me. I know that the saints of the desert hate women who like me, are made to please. I am afraid that you hate me, and you want to hurt me. Go, I do not doubt your power, but no, Paphnutius, that you should neither despise me nor hate me. I have never, like many of the men I know, laughed at your voluntary poverty. In your turn, do not make a crime of my riches. I am beautiful and clever in acting. I no more choose my condition than my nature. I was made for that which I do. I was born to charm men. And you yourself, did you not say just now that you loved me? 
Do not use your science against me. Do not pronounce magic words which would destroy my beauty or change me into a statue of salt. Do not terrify me. I am already too frightened. Do not kill me. I am so afraid of death. He made a sign to her to rise and said, Child, have no fear. I will utter no word of shame or scorn. I come on behalf of him who sat on the edge of the well and drank of the pitcher which the woman of Samaria offered to him, and who also, when he supped at those houses of Simon, received the perfumes of Mary. I am not without sin that I should throw the first stone. I have often badly employed the abundant grace which God has bestowed upon me. It was not anger, but pity which took me by the hand to conduct me here. I can, without deceit, address thee in words of love, for it is the zeal in my heart which has brought me to thee. I burn with the fire of charity. And if thy eyes, accustomed only to the gross sights of the flesh, could see things in their mystic aspect, I should appear unto thee as a branch, broken off the burning bush which the Lord showed on the mountain to Moses of old, that he might understand true love, that which envelops us, and which, so far from leaving behind it mere coals and ashes, purifies and perfumes forever that which it penetrates. I believe you, monk, and no longer fear either deceit or ill will from you. I have often heard talk of the hermits of the Tabaid. Marvelous things have been told concerning Antony and Paul. Your name is not unknown to me, and I have heard say that Though you are still young, you equal in virtue the oldest anchorites. As soon as I saw you, and without knowing who you were, I felt that you were no ordinary man. Tell me, can you do for me that which neither the priests of Isis, nor of Hermes, nor of the celestial Juno, nor the Chaldean soothsayers, nor the Babylonian Magi have been able to effect? Monk, if you love me, can you prevent me from dying? Woman, whosoever wishes to live, shall live. Flee from the abominable delights in which thou diest forever. Snatch from the devils, who will burn it most horribly, that body which God kneaded with his spittle and animated with his own breath. Thou art consumed with weariness. Come, and refresh thyself at the blessed springs of solitude. Come, and drink of those fountains which are hidden in the desert, and which gush forth to heaven. Careworn soul, come, and possess that which thou desirest. Heart greedy for joy, come and taste true joys. Poverty, retirement, self-forgetfulness, seclusion in the bosom of God enemy of Christ now, and tomorrow his well-beloved. Come to him, come thou whom I have sought, and thou wilt say, I have found love. Thais seemed lost in meditation on things afar. Monk, she asked, if I endure all pleasures and do penance, is it true that I shall be born again in heaven, my body intact in all its beauty? Thais, I bring thee eternal life. Believe me, for that which I announce to thee is the truth. Who will assure me that it is the truth? David and the prophets, the scriptures, and the wonders that thou shalt behold. Monk, I should like to believe you, for I must confess that I have not found happiness in this world. My lot in life is better than that of a queen, and yet I have many bitternesses and misfortunes, 
and I am infinitely weary of my existence. All women envy me, and yet sometimes I have envied the lot of a toothless old woman when I was a child sold honey cakes under one of the city gates. Often has the idea flashed across my mind that only the poor are good, happy, and blessed, and that there must be great gladness in living humble and obscure. Monk, you have agitated a storm in my soul and brought to the surface that which lay at the bottom. Who am I to believe, alas, and what is to become of me, and what is life? Whilst she thus spoke, Paphnutius was transfigured. Celestial joy beamed in his face. Listen, he said, I was not alone when I entered this house. Another accompanied me, another who stands by my side. Him thou canst not see, because thy eyes are yet unworthy to behold him. But soon thou shalt see him in all his glorious splendor, and thou wilt say, he alone is to be adored. But now, if he had not placed his gentle hands before my eyes, O Thais, I should perhaps have fallen into sin with thee, for of myself I am but weak and sinful. But he saved us both. He is as good as he is powerful, and his name is the Saviour. He was promised to the world by David and the prophets, worshipped in his cradle by the shepherds and the magi, crucified by the Pharisees, buried by the holy women, revealed to the world by the apostles, testified to by the martyrs. And now, having learned that thou fearest death, O woman, he has come to thy house to prevent thee from dying." Art thou not here present with me, Jesus, at this moment, as thou didst appear to the men of Galilee in those wonderful days when the stars, which came down with thee from heaven, were so near the earth that the holy innocents could take them in their hands when they played in their mother's arms on the terraces of Bethlehem? Is it not true, Jesus, that thou art here present, and that thou showest me in reality thy precious body? Is it not thy face here, and that tear which flows down thy cheek a real tear? Yes, the angel of eternal justice shall receive it, and it shall be the ransom of the soul of Thais. Art thou not here, Jesus? Jesus, thy loving lips open. Thou canst speak, speak, I hear thee. And thee, Thais, happy Thais, listen to what the Savior himself says to thee. It is he who speaks, not I. He says, I have sought thee long, O my lost sheep. I have found thee at last. Fly from me no more. Let me take thee by the hands, poor little one, and I will bear thee on my shoulders to the heavenly fold. Come, my Thais, come, my chosen one, come and weep with me. And Paphnutius fell on his knees, his eyes filled with ecstasy, and then Thais saw in his face the likeness of the living Christ. O oh, vanished days of my childhood, she sobbed. O oh, sweet father, alms, good Saint Theodore, why did I not die in thy white mantle which thou didst bear me, in the first dawn of day yet fresh from the waters of baptism? Paphnutius advanced towards her, crying, Thou art baptized. O oh, divine wisdom, O oh, providence, O oh, great God, I know now the power which drew me to thee. I know what rendered thee so dear and so beautiful in my eyes. It was the virtue of the baptismal water which made me leave the shadow of God, where I lived to seek thee in the poisoned air where men dwell. A drop, a drop, no doubt, of the water which washed thy body had been spread sprinkled in my face. Come, O oh my sister, and receive from thy brother the kiss of peace. And the monk, touched with his lips, 
the forehead of the courtesan. Then he was silent, letting God speak, and nothing was heard in the grotto of nymphs but the sobs of Thais, mingled with the rippling of running water. She wept without trying to stop her tears when two black slaves appeared loaded with stuffs, perfumes, and garlands. It was hardly the right time to weep, she said, trying to smile. Tears redden the eyes and spoil the complexion, and I must sup tonight with some friends and want to be beautiful, for there will be women there quick to spy out marks of care on my face. These slaves come to dress me. Withdraw, my father, and allow them to do their work. They are clever and experienced, and I pay them well for their services. You see that one who wears the thick rings of gold and shows such white teeth? I took her from the wife of the proconsul. Paphnutius had at first a thought of dissuading Thais, as earnestly as he could, from going to this supper. But he determined to act prudently, and asked what person she would meet there. She replied that there would be the host, old Cotta, the prefect of the fleet, Nicias, and several other philosophers who loved an argument, and poet Callicrates, the high priest of Serapis, some young men whose chief amusement was training horses, and lastly some women, of whom there was little to be said except that they were young. Then, by supernatural inspiration, Go amongst them, Thais, said the monk. Go, but I will not leave thee. I will go with thee to this banquet, and will remain by thy side without saying a word. She burst out laughing, and whilst her two black slaves were busy dressing her, she cried, What will they say when they see that I have a monk of the Tebaid for my lover? End of part second. Section 2